session uh, that uh, actually is being recorded now. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Colin Jones here at the BSC and also to have a talk about the, uh, the UK plans about, about, about Earth system modeling, which is so uh, uh, key uh, for, for us. And uh, it's very important to really be aware of uh, what the uh, leading institutions are doing uh, in, uh, in Europe. So um, at least it, it's a great opportunity for me and uh, I hope also for you to learn. Uh, Colin is uh, it's a, it's a professor at the University of Leeds and uh, it's a, a senior scientist uh, in, at NCARS uh, at, the, at the UK as well. And uh, he's leading the uh, UK Earth System Modeling Program, uh, which uh, I guess he's going to talk us, uh, to, to us about. So without any more uh, introductions, because most of you already might already uh, seen Colin talking, uh, it's, uh, it's already uh, time okay. for you to okay. take over. All right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Unusual world of us. <laughs> Okay, so let me share. Looks like I can be seen. Yeah, okay. And uh, there you are. Uh, so hold on, I need to share the screen Not here. Okay, so I think- Participants can now see your application, okay. And just to check, can you hear me okay? Would does someone like to answer? Uh, yes, we'll do. Yes, yes you can hear well. Okay, great. All right, then I'll go ahead. Um, I don't know how you do these online meetings. If someone, we, we normally, if there's a question, stick it in the chat. Is that what you do? Uh, yeah, people, people can also raise their hands okay. in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the list of participants. Will you uh, see so them though? Uh, we can see them at the end. Okay, so all we right. Can, if... uh, we can stop uh, sharing and uh, okay. see uh, if there are any right. hands up. If, uh, if there's something that I say that you, that you need some clarification straight away, just interrupt. Um, I can't see the hands, that's, uh, that's the issue. Okay, so I lead the UK Earth System Modeling team. That's a team that is partly NERC. NERC stands for Natural Environmental Research Council. And uh, I can see I've got the wrong glasses on. I'm gonna have to step away from the screen one minute. Apologies for that. I need to swap from blue to black. Right, now I can read what I've written. Yeah, so it's uh, the, the UK Earth System Modeling is a, co is a coordinate, a collaboration between the NERC centres, which are government funded centres, but they're independent of, they're not, they're not, they're not uh, civil servants, uh, and the Met Office Hadley Centre. So I have teams from NERC and from the Met Office Hadley Centre. And we had a UK Earth System Modeling project that was funded for a five-year period. That came to an end. Uh, and we're replacing it now by something called Terra Firma, uh, which stands for Future Impacts, Risks, and Mitigation Actions in a Changing Earth System. Um, and as with most of these activities now, we're having to be more moving into what you might call the solutions agenda from the, um, from uh, away from the, let's say, the warning agenda. So I was going to tell you a little bit about what Terra Firma will be doing. Um, it's just started. It started on the 1st of April. It is a direct continuation of, of the UK ESM project, many of the same people, but the emphasis is a little bit different. Um, and some of the figures at the bottom there tell you a little bit about what the emphasis is, and I'll talk you through that. Um, so some of the background to uh, the project and why it was developed. So some of the background is, as, as you know, that the Paris Climate Agreement there's an aim to keep global warming below two degrees relative to pre-industrial levels. Uh, I also don't have a clock I can see in front of me. That's oh, right. I've okay. got some idea of how long I'm taking. I don't, so I don't talk for too long. That'll do. Okay. Uh, and as we know, the Earth is warmed by just over one degree already. Um, then there are pledges, which are called Nationally Determined Contributions, or NDCs. And if uh, countries follow what they promised um, at Paris, uh, which they're not doing at the moment, but if they were, then there'd be a probable warming of order three degrees. So a consequence of that is the world is likely to, likely, not definitely, but likely to exceed two degrees 
or what we might refer to as an overshoot. And after that, there may be efforts to cool the climate and stabilize it thereafter, for example, at two degrees of warming. Um, so as a consequence, we need to assess the risks associated with such overshoots and the options that are available for reducing greenhouse gas emissions rapidly and re for removing CO2 from the atmosphere, so for getting negative emissions. Okay, so the primary goals of this project, and then I'll talk a little bit more in detail about them. One is to develop the next version of the UK Earth System Modelling, we're going to call it UKSM2, um, and to perform with that model and with uh, the present model a range of what we'll call warming overshoot and stabilisation projections, and I'll, I'll explain what those are subsequently. Uh, within the context of developing the model, we know we need to constrain and improve the representation of the carbon cycle and feedbacks involving the carbon cycle and climate. So that's one emphasis. Um, can the feedback from your phone. Yeah, sorry. Okay, and with the, the simulations, we are going to look at the risk of rapid change in a, key, in a number of Earth system phenomena. And I'll talk about those in a bit. Um, and that's rapid change in, in the context of overshooting these Paris targets. And then also in the context of being in long-term warming stabilization scenarios. So potentially being at 1.5 degrees or two degrees semi-permanently after an overshoot. Uh, and as well as looking at the risk of rapid change, we're gonna look at the risk of certain regional climate changes and the impact on society. Uh, another emphasis, and I realize I don't have a, I should get a pointer up here. Oh, your your. It it's different no, to mine. No, it's just no. different to mine. Oh, here we go. Yeah. Laser pointer. Okay, so, you can you can use yeah, the mouse. I'll use a laser pointer. Okay, we're also going to be looking at some mitigation options focusing on near-term climate forces and land use, and I'll talk a bit about those subsequently. Uh, we've we we have got um, particularly UK government stakeholders that are in the project so we need to give them policy guidance and one thing this team is is funded to do is to support the rest of the uk in using uk developed their system models so we have to provide what we call national capability uh, this is how the project is structured so we're structured into six work packages and um, so you can think of this almost like an eu project um, we've got a work package one on developing the models and simulations and using observations for analysis so that's a, that's a pretty big and chunky work package. There's a work package two, which is concentrating on near-term climate forces and potential for mitigation. There's a work package three that is very much on the carbon cycle, but it will also look at land use uh, as a mitigation option. Work package four, which is the one where we're looking at rapid or irreversible change in the earth system. Work package five is the impacts work package. And then work package six, which is an important one and is linked to our policy people, which are these are government organizations, Bayes, DEFRA, and FCDO. I won't go into what they are, but they're responsible for things like climate policy, air quality, and overseas development. Uh, and then Public Health England is responsible, as, as you can think, for public health. Uh, and CCC is the Committee on Climate Change, which is an independent committee, but advises government on policy to achieve government aims in the context of climate change. So one of those is particularly the net zero uh, policy, which we, the UK should be net zero by 2050. Um, uh, whether it will be is another thing completely. So work package six is, is very much trying to connect to policy, but also connect a little bit to the public uh, in terms of what we do. Okay, so I'll just say a little bit about these different work packages and a little bit about what we're gonna try and do. So work package one is very much about developing the next uh, system model, um, evaluating it, tuning it, and then running these overshoot and mitigation experiments. Um, so just to give some kind of context to that, the figure is showing estimates of emissions on the, on the vertical axis of uh, carbon dioxide in gigatons uh, and the, as a function of time for potentially different futures with different warming levels at 2100, going from sort of current policies. So these are the NDCs, which will land us, if, if we follow the NDCs and we take a median climate sensitivity of around about three degrees order in 2100. And then there's different pledges. So there's some pledges that have been made. I think these are probably the Paris pledges. I don't know for sure, actually, I should have looked that up, which would land us at around about 2.5 degrees at 2100. 
going down to um, some of the uh, SSPs in CMIP6, which have a two degree pathway and a 1.5 degree pathway. And you can see in all of these, there's a very requirement for pretty rapid and enormous reductions in the emissions of CO2 almost immediately, not, all, not, not immediately, but almost immediately with the need for net zero uh, in some of the pathways at 2060 or 2070 in terms of the two degree pathway and even negative emissions thereafter, which means taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. So this is some of the questions that, are, that follow from that are, are the realistic mitigation actions or pathways that will result in a global mean surface temperature increase of less than 1.5 or two degrees at 2100? Uh, and if there are not, what might happen if some of these targets, 1.5 or two degrees are exceeded? Um, and particularly what might happen in our project to certain abrupt changes or potential abrupt changes and to certain societal economical impacts. Uh, and will those impacts and changes be reversible if we overshoot and come back to two, one or two degrees? And what happens if we stabilize at those temperatures? So if we continue at let's say two degrees after 2100 for another 100, 150 years, what will be the risk for stabilization and impact from that change? Uh, and just to give a bit more context to that, so this is a figure that, that relates carbon emissions, which are the black is the black line. Um, so you can think of having a peak emissions of CO2 at some point in the future, hopefully fairly soon. That would translate into the largest in red, the largest rate of warming would be largely coincident with the highest emission of CO2, because um, that will be the highest concentration of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and then as CO2 falls, but is still positive emissions, warming will still occur, but it will occur hopefully at a, a lower, slower rate. And then as, as, as CO2 emissions or as CO2, yeah, CO2 emissions, including natural sources and sinks, so the, the rate of change of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, hits zero, then warming should peak. So this is the, when net zero is a combination of anthropogenic emissions and natural sources and sinks, bringing CO2 uh, emissions uh, in that definition to, to a net zero. And then warming would peak. What happens thereafter in terms of CO2 emissions could be that you have essentially net zero emissions. So anthropogenic CO2 emissions are balanced by natural, the natural sinks, let's say, or sinks being greater than sources from the natural world, or there could be net negative emissions, which is actively taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And if we actively take CO2 out of the atmosphere, be it through natural or, or anthropogenic activities, then temperatures might come down. So we're interested in creating scenarios that sort of mimic this warming going up to a certain level potentially overshooting and then coming back and stabilizing or just stabilizing at, at its lowest level and asking what will happen as we go into the future. So to put that in another way, these are idealized warming overshoot scenarios. So again, you can think of these as running off pre-industrial experiments as we know them in CMIP6 and then ramping up emissions at a constant rate or even ramping up concentration. So a 1% CO2 run in CMIP6 would see an increase of 1% per year in CO2 concentrations. We'll try and do this in terms of emissions. So we run with an emission driven model and allow the full carbon cycle climate feedback. Um, but think of it off a pre-industrial run, running with constant emissions until global mean temperature relative to the pre-industrial reaches some threshold, be it 1.5 degrees or two degrees. And at that point, we will then try and stabilize the model through turning emissions to be net zero. It won't go perfectly in a flat line along one and a half degrees, but we believe based on ZECMAP experiments, it will closely approximate 1.5 degrees anyway. Uh, and we'll, we'll try and hold temperatures at that level for a certain amount of time, or let's say two degrees here, the yellow line. And then if there's a certain amount of stabilization, we'll then take one scenario where we'll actively re remove CO2, um, so we'll have negative emissions and temperatures will decrease at some rate. And there's experimentation to try and figure out what that rate will be until we come back to say 1.5 degrees and then we stabilize through having zero emissions again, zero net emissions. Uh, and then we'll stabilize at 1.5 degree or we'll stabilize at two degrees. 
So after some experimentation, and this will take a little bit of trial and error, uh, and we'll use a simpler, we have a faster model of the Earth system to try and understand what kind of up, uh, ramp up, ramp down emissions we need to achieve these runs. Uh, we'll, we'll have a, a selection of runs that overshoot one and a half degrees or overshoot two degrees for different time periods, and then come back to their targets at different rates uh, and then stabilize. So we'll have a whole selection of simulations that are warming, stabilization, cooling, stabilization. And those are the runs that we will use to try and investigate these rapid change in environmental impacts. In addition to the what we call idealized scenarios, we work with uh, integrated assessment modeling groups to develop some more what I call realistic overshoot emission scenarios. So we've already got some overshoot scenarios in CMIP 6, but they're overshooting certainly higher than the 1.5 and 2 degree run. Uh, so we're going to try and develop with the IAM group, and we have some already that are overshoots around 1.5 degrees. And we'll use those as well in the project. Uh, OK, so just to say quickly a little bit about our model development. Um, so UKSM, the UK Earth System model in CMIP 6, it was built on what's called the HADGEM 3 GC 3.1 physical model. Then it had a um, fully interactive carbon cycle. Uh, and on land, it also had nitrogen limitation. And we predict vegetation. So it has dynamic vegetation as well, with nine plant functional types and a soil carbon model. In the ocean, we have an intermediate complexity um, uh, um, marine biogeochemical model. Uh, we have a pretty advanced aerosol scheme um, with five different modes for aerosol. So five different types of aerosol, like sea salt, organic carbon, SO, uh, uh, SO2, um, dust. I can't remember what the other one is. It'll come to me. And then we have two moments. So we predict the mass and the number of aerosol. Uh, we have a chemistry scheme that's pretty complex and pretty expensive. It covers the stratosphere, troposphere, and is linked directly into the aerosol scheme. And it predicts the thing, it predicts things like, uh, well, it predicts many things, but it predicts ozone. It predicts now methane as well, which uh, is important. In CMIP 6, we had fully interactive methane, but we anchored it by prescribing the lowest level methane uh, concentration. So it wasn't totally free. In our next model, it will be totally free for methane as well. Uh, and we have an interactive ice sheet model. So we have Antarctica and Greenland interactively predicted uh, in terms of ice mass, ice concentration. Uh, and the model ran at N96, which is about 135 kilometers or 1.2 degrees, 85 levels in the, ver in the vertical, up to 85 kilometers, so right through into the mesosphere. Uh, the, the ocean is fairly familiar to you. It's the Nemo Orca 1 configuration. It was, I think it's Nemo 3.6 in CMIP 6, and it was 75 levels in a vertical, and there's a whole suite of, of references, particularly some in a journal of um, modeling the Earth system, James, where we had a special issue on UK Earth system models that came out in 2010. Um, we developed uh, an intermediate model, which we called UKSM 1.1. The reason we did that is UKSM 1, out of the box, had a rather poor representation of the historical period. So as you can see here, the global mean surface temperature the blue one that was the UKSM model and had excessive cooling um, in the sort of 1950 to 1980 period. Uh, and we traced that to be due to probably uh, the representation of SO2. So SO2 is an important precursor to SO4. SO4 is the primary um, aerosol that condensation occurs on. So we had two strong aerosol, negative aerosol radiative forcing, we felt. Um, we changed some of the parameterizations of the SO2 dry deposition to particularly account for surface wetness. So precipitation causes surface plants particularly to get wet. And SO2 then deposits more rapidly and efficiently onto a wet surface um, because SO2 is highly soluble. So when we changed these things, we had stronger SO2 deposition. We had a weaker aerosol effect. And that's the red curve in effect. And this is the northern hemisphere extratropics where the change in temperature, that's where all the action is. Black is observations. So we didn't go the whole way, but we got some improvement. Um, we did not change in any way, and largely in any way, the transient climate response or the equilibrium climate sensitivity by making these changes. And we didn't change particularly when we ran SSPs either. So this was very much only a change in the historical period. It was an interim model that we have now, but this is the one we're building on for UKSM2. Uh, and UKSM2 
uh, will be therefore built on a new physical model developed again at the Hadley Centre, which is called GC5. Uh, I won't go into any of the details of GC5 at the moment. Uh, the ocean is NEMO 4 at the moment, but we will upgrade to 4.2. Um, and a lot of you know about the NEMO configurations. We're going to keep at the same resolution for the standard model. So that's N96 or 135 degrees. L85 again, and we're going to keep to the same ocean. Uh, we have developed already what we call a hybrid resolution model. So that already runs and exists. And we'll try and use that a bit more actively in CNIP 6. It now goes for the physical model. It goes to about 60 degrees in the atmosphere, or N216. But we interactively will keep running the chemistry and aerosol at N96. And these talk to each other, the physics and the chemistry, every hour. And we'll do the same in the ocean. We'll run the ocean physics a quarter of a degree or, or a quarter. And we'll have a, a, a way of degrading the dynamics of the biogeochemistry. So that will run at about a, at about a 0.75 degree, or three times the resolution. Um, and that we think allows us to be able to run the fuller system model, maybe for proper simulations, which we couldn't do in CMIT 6. In terms of the science, so the new model will run with emissions of CO2 and methane, so it runs with a full methane cycle. That already is working. Um, we'll have interactive ice, free, ice sheets, as I mentioned already. We'll build an interactive fire that links to the carbon cycle and atmospheric composition. Uh, permafrost, definitely the physics of permafrost. Hopefully, the biogeochemistry of permafrost, nitrate aerosol, which we did not have in CMIP 6, and probably predicted pH for cloud water, which we think is important for aerosol processes again. Uh, and the model structure all, it all looks like this. It's a fairly expensive model. It runs in the standard, in the standard configuration that can, we can get about four years per day at this resolution. If we go to the hybrid one, it drops to about two years a day. But we think we can speed those things up. Um, and we don't want it to become any slower than that. Um, these are some examples that I might skip over just to give you more meat on, on what the project is. But the interactive fire model is working now and is producing reasonable estimates of things like burnt area. Uh, as you can see in this one, this is an AMIP run. Right is the model, left is GFED. Um, and that's, that's documented in a, in a G, uh, geosciences uh, GMD paper at the bottom there. Um, and the ice sheet model, again, as I say, is working and it's been run. This is an example just for an SSP5, so the fairly vigorous uh, CNIP6. And this is showing surface mass balance, change, mass balance change over Greenland and over Antarctica. Uh, and I won't go into any details, but Antarctica in, uh, out to 2100 doesn't produce a very large change in terms of sea level, which is what we've got here in the top left. But it looks like it commits us to a very, a very large sea level in the sort of subsequent century. So changes, particularly in these areas I'm highlighting here, uh, and my my geography of Antarctica isn't great, mm -hmm. but I think that's the Ross Sea, uh, and this one, no, that's the Weddell Sea, right. and this is the Ross Sea, um, and it's changes in um, marine ice sheets and and the change in the marine ice sheet, which doesn't affect the sea level but looks like it leaves the potential for very large subsequent changes of land ice in the subsequent century. So, so having the Greenland ice sheet in and running longer helps us to look for committed change that we might call irreversible as well. And this is just an example of the emission driven model, which is working and producing reasonable distributions of methane as well. Um, and it allows us to look at things like methane pledges and the impact of that and methane mitigation. Uh, and the ice sheets, of course, allow us to look at sea level rise and tipping points. OK, so this is getting back to that terra firma project. Uh, and just to go through some of the aims there and where we're going over the next uh, five years, in effect. So we have a work package that will look at near term climate forces and particularly methane, but not only methane. We'll try and under understand past and present trends in methane. And then also look at the sensitivity of, me of future methane and methane sources and sinks. So natural sources like wetlands and natural sources like permafrost. And then we'll also look at the interaction of methane with the tropospheric ozone. Methane is an important gas for OH in the atmosphere, which is an important then gas determining ozone concentrations, tropospheric ozone. That's important both for warming, but also for air quality. Uh, we'll also have something that looks particularly at aerosols, and in particular, the role of aerosols in regional climate over Asia as one focus. 
Um, we'll try and do something on climate change and air quality in relation to the near-term climate forces. And that in particular, we've got a pretty ambitious activity to try and run uh, our own model with the chemistry and aerosols active and downscale it regionally, but first at 12 kilometers over the Euro, over the Euro cortex domain. But so that's the whole of Europe. And then subsequently, if we can afford it, at two to four kilometer, some time slices only, so sort of 10 or 20 year time slices present and into the future over the UK to look at air quality aspects um, and to ask are the co-benefits of mitigation that hit both climate change and air quality as we go into the future. Uh, this is just one example of methane uh, potential mitigation. So there's been so we know methane has a short lifetime. Methane's lifetime in the atmosphere is around about 10 years, whereas CO2 is around about 400 years. So if you have have you if you if you reduce methane emissions, it can have a rapid impact on climate. Uh, and this is just giving you some examples. Here is methane emissions following some baseline. If you do economically viable changes, and they're either fast in the strong line or delayed in the dotted line, or more ambitious, technically feasible ones dashed in the is fast, dotted is slow. Um, there isn't a time axis on here, unfortunately, I've cut that off. But this line here is 2050. And if you implement these economically feasible or technically feasible, you can get about a 0.5 change in or 0.25 to 0.5 change in temperatures at 2050 through methane mitigation um, going up to a, bit, a little bit higher further out uh, and these these dashed lines are here or lines are just showing um, on the bottom the percent change in warming rate at 2050 uh, and at the top the avoided warming at 2050 relative to the baseline so you can get about a quarter of a degree to a 20 to 2.1 of a degree just from methane emission reductions at 2050. So that's quite significant if you're talking about 1.5 or two degrees, where we've only got a, one point, a half degree or two degree space to come. So we're interested in that. And then we're interested in the carbon cycle because changes in the carbon cycle, of course, can impact um, the, can, can influence the impact of carbon emission reductions on temperature as well. Uh, but we're also interested in the carbon cycle through its potential to be a mitigation in itself particularly if we think about active afforestation or bioenergy and carbon capture storage. So we'll try and look with the full Earth system model at the potential for these for mitigation. Uh, and one of the reasons we're interested in that, of course, this is showing on the top, I think you're all familiar with this, historical emissions of CO2 from uh, anthropogenic activities and then emissions of CO2 from land use, uh, and then the uptake in the oceans on land in light blue, and what's left in the atmosphere in red to warm the planet. So approximately half of the CO2 emitted has been taken up by either the ocean or um, the terrestrial biosphere. And we're particularly interested in the terrestrial biosphere in terms of mitigation. Um, and we're keen to know how, we, how much we can perturb the land carbon sink, meaning increase CO2 uptake without negative effects elsewhere on things like food security, um, and what the role of the natural carbon sinks are in mitigation in terms of changing the anthropogenic carbon uh, emitted and taken up through things like active bets. bets. Uh, I'm going to skip over this. Well, I'm going to sort of just quickly explain this one and then skip over the next one. This is just to emphasize that really in CMIP 6, this is the budget of CO2 in four times CO2 runs from different CMIP 6 models, and it's saying uh, at four times CO2, this is a, a sort of 1% CO2 run in emission mode um, out to four times CO2. And at four times CO2, it's saying how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. And most of the models are constrained to have around about the same because they're trying to get to four times pre-industrial. Uh, pre and then it's saying how much of the CO2 has gone into the ocean in light blue and how much is in the terrestrial soils or vegetation at four times CO2. And you can see that the biggest uncertainty in the carbon distribution is in the land, um, the land sink. It's not the, the ocean sink is not um, totally uncertain. There is some difference between big models. This is the fractional amount going into the different components, but the land carbon sink is the biggest one. So that's why we're putting some emphasis on understanding and improving land carbon feedbacks. I'll skip that one for time. Um, so one of the things we're also interested in in work package four 
is rapid or irre irreversible change. So warming and then regional feedbacks could produce instabilities in different aspects of the Earth system uh, and push the state of some aspect of the Earth system, let's call this ice sheets for want of a better description, into another state through these feedbacks that then becomes relatively stable and it may be hard to get back to the original state. So this might be um, ice in one state and this might be ice melt in another state. And it may be hard to get back to this one, even if you cool again. So we're interested in the risk of triggering these rapid changes or tipping points as they're known um, in many areas, but let's, I think we'll call them rapid change. Uh, and we're gonna look at that in, in the context of a number of different um, changes. So this is an example of different rapid changes. So you could have, uh, this is gonna be hard to move down. You could be rapid change in the Antarctic ice sheets, could be rapid change in uh, tropical forests, could be rapid change in the AMOC ocean circulation, rapid change over the Antarctic ice sheets, uh, sorry, the Antarctic sea ice or the Greenland ice sheet or permafrost or things like coral reefs. So in our project, we're gonna concentrate on three areas, particularly um, Greenland and Ant Antarctic ice melts because we have now interactive ice sheets in the model and that connects particularly to sea level rise, marine ecosystems and productivity connecting to fisheries and coral reefs and then tropical forests, particularly the Amazon, connected to biodiversity and carbon uptake. Uh, and we're interested in what happens as we exceed two degrees and come back to two degrees and then stay at two degrees long term to these three different areas. We, we may see no rapid changes. We may see big rapid changes. We actually simply don't know, um, particularly as we run long term out into the future, what will happen. Uh, and we'll also try and investigate through observations and models, can we get some indication of potential uh, early warning indicators of rapid change in these three phenomena. Um, so Antarctic ice sheets is one of the ones we're very interested in. Um, and for that, um, so these are, these are ice sheets that stick out over the ocean. Um, and as they begin to melt, then ocean water, warm water can get below what's called the grounding line and could push in and make the ice sheet unstable. So what, what was weight borne on land now becomes something that potentially viable for collapse as the warm water comes underneath and sort of decay, erodes the area that is connected to the, to the land and the weight bearing area. Uh, and this ice can then potentially collapse and cause significant sea level rise. So we're very interested in looking into that with our new model, but small scale ocean ice interactions are the key to this. And they're not very easy to represent, but we're going to have a go. And we think this will take, th take things forward in the terms of understanding, particularly the Arctic contribution to sea level rise. Uh, and then the last work package, or no, sorry, the last active science work package is on the impacts on society and environment of change, particularly under the context of these overshoot projections and stabilization projections. And we're going to look at four areas of impact water resources, air quality wildfires, because we have interactive wildfires in the model, marine ecosystems and sea level rise, particularly linked again to the ice sheets. Uh, but we do have some focus. So we'll look at these a little bit globally for some of them, but we have a focus for the impacts on Sub-Saharan Africa, the South Asian monsoon region, which means particularly India, the Indian subcontinent, but also the ocean around India um, and the North Atlantic and the UK, the UK particular in terms of air quality, and the North Atlantic, again, in terms of marine ecosystems. Um, and we're looking at impacts and impacts avoided from overshoot scenarios and different warming stabilizations. So one degree, two degree, and three degree. Um, and potentially the impacts associated with any triggered rapid changes and maybe impacts avoided from our near-term climate forcer and land use mitigation actions. And then last work package six is about knowledge integration, trying to bring in our stakeholders, so the government stakeholders particularly, they'll be involved in the design of the mitigation experiments. And we hope we'll be providing through those mitigation experiments and analysis of the overshoot runs, something useful in terms of guiding policy on the risks of rapid, of rapid change and the benefits and the, 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 um, the benefits and the pathways of going for two degrees and 1.5 degree. And one of the areas we also have some emphasis is 
ensuring that we communicate with the public around the activities we're um, following. Okay, last two slides on how we link to a, a proposal that has just gone in that uh, BSC is involved in through the EC Earth model. And that one, some of you will know this Optim ESM or Optimism, as we call it, which stands for Optimal High Resolution Earth System Models for Exploring Future Climate Change. This is coordinated by the Swedish Meteorological and Hydrological Institute, the Rosby Center. So years ago, I was head of the Rosby Center. Um, this is now being coordinated by Turbin Koenig at the Rosby Center. There's four Earth system models involved, of which one is EC Earth. Uh, Barcelona are involved, uh, SMHI are involved, the Danish Meteor DMI, and also the um, KNMI in the Netherlands, and, and also the University of Lund. So there's a pretty high EAC Earth activity, which I think means you've each not got a lot of money, but you've got some money. Um, we're involved through UKSM, but there's a lot of UK partners involved, and hopefully we will still be involved when the project starts. Um, then there's the French models, uh, IPSL in Paris, and the CNRM model, Toulouse, uh, uh, Surfax, and Meteo France. Probably it's five years, hopefully starting in late 2022. So it was submitted in February. This is the... Um, the sort of strap line for the project. So the primary goal of optimism is to develop the next generation of ESMs. We always say that. Um, so it's in the same call as the other project that BSC is involved in called ERI. So ERI is more about physical climate models and higher resolution. Uh, these are about the earth system components, biogeochemical cycles and slightly lower resolution. So you could say that these models are trying to get to the resolution of what was the Primavera project of old. Um, in terms of Earth system models. So trying to get to around about the 50 kilometer resolution, let's say a quarter of a degree in the ocean. Um, and we'll probably do that through a mix of what I said earlier, um, one resolution for the physics and another resolution for the chemistry in the atmosphere or the biogeochemistry in the ocean running interactively. And it's to deliver, deliver long-term climate projections to support policy need and to particularly look at regional climate change and the risk of abrupt rapid change at different levels of global warming. And you might think, hey, hey, this is quite similar to what I've just been talking about. And it is, and that's deliberately the case in our, in our context anyway. So it's split into six work packages. The green is about models. So one is developing the next generation. So in our case, it's the second UK ESM um, with higher resolution and also improved processes and some calibration and spin up um, acceleration. Then using those model, uh, developing new emission scenarios. So this is run. This is PIC in the uh, in Germany, developing new emission scenarios that overshoot two degrees and come back to two degrees. Um, there's some statistical downscaling that is really where the uh, regional impacts are working, and that's PIC again. They will downscale some of these new projections, um, and then we will be running some idealized projections similar to the ones I just talked about earlier. Um, with what we refer to as post CMIP 6 models. So in our case, that'll be the UKSM 1.1 that I talked about. Uh, and later on, we will run high resolution models, we hope, uh, and the standard models with these new projections that will be more realistic in inverted commas overshoot runs of one and a half and two degrees. So these will occur on the timescale of CMIP 6, CMIP 7, we believe, sort of 2026 timescale. Uh, 2027. Um, and then we have work packages looking at abrupt change in many features. So ice sheets, sea, day, sea ice permafrost, ocean circulation in terms of AMOC and the biogeochemistry, tropical forests and semi-arid regions as well. Um, and looking at regional impacts of the change uh, on things like extreme events, coastal sea level, etc. And then there's also uh, a policy and communication activity. So that looks very much like our terra firma project. And for us, that's good news because it means we can do a little bit more than what we did, we promised in the UK project. And in particular have or contribute to a multi-model, at least four model in the context of this project ensemble. And we hope a few other models. So in optimism, we also have as international collaborators, NCAR, GFDL and CCMA in Canada. So we hope to have a slightly bigger one. Oh, and the Japanese MIROC group as well. Uh, and I won't talk about this one, but there's a timeline as well in terms of how these models will develop. But I think instead I'll stop there um, okay. for time and 
yeah if there's Very any good. questions happy to answer them yeah okay. thanks a lot Colin. Right. thanks uh, we, we we never know if uh, if it's a good idea to clap here or not no and uh, i know yeah no, so and it's, it's i can clap my, you can clap me right. yeah <laughs> <laughs> then i can hear yeah there you go okay so i can see here shall i take shall i maybe i keep no, this you, open you can in case it. you go so back I, and forward. I can see the hands okay, here right. uh and and also the chat so all right in, uh, you, you can you can just keep the slides in case you you want to mm -hmm. go back to any yep. of them um so they, there's a question from uh uh marcus marcus donat hi marcus you're muted marcus still yeah. mute. yeah hi actually <laughs> yeah go for it I don't know. I, um, I I didn't raise my hand. <laughs> and I oh, wow. in the in the participant <laughs> list. I don't know what um happened, but um yeah. Thanks, Colin, for the um really nice talk. Um, re regarding the I mean now that I'm on the microphone, I, I don't know now I've disappeared again. You know, in the in the other list, that's awkward. Okay. Um, re regarding the the tipping elements in the, or the overshoot scenarios no i mean i guess you could relate them um are there let's say in in the level of overshoots we are talking about no in, uh, regarding the policy the policy targets around one and a half and two degrees um are there any specific expectations where we actually um think it makes an, a difference, no? Like this, within half a degree of overshoot, let's say, mm -hmm. um, that, that certain tipping points might already be triggered. Or yeah, I, I I would answer that by saying I think we don't know is the honest answer. Mm. Um, there's probably indications that well, if we, for sure we know that the Arctic sea ice that that's a rapid that's rapidly changing. So that's that's an example of a rapid change. As opposed to let's say an abrupt tipping point change um there's already some indications that the, the amazon is at risk of rapidly changing again uh, whether you call that a tipping point or just rapid climate change i mean the two are the two are sort of intertwined i think so those two are examples of um things that potentially are, are occurring already so they may well be at strong risk of Let's say, uh, let's say if warming went to two and a half degrees and came back and stayed at two degrees. So I think an important thing is that some of these policy targets, are, uh, are, 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 we will stay at two degrees. Um, we won't go back to where we are today. Um, so if that's the case, do we know long term that there won't be changes triggered that become either rapid or irreversible in the case of the ice sheets? I think the answer is we probably don't know. Um, and does it make any difference if there's a half a degree overshoot versus a quarter of a degree overshoot? Again, I think the answer is we probably don't know. My 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 best guess is it probably doesn't make a major difference actually if we're at quarter of a degree or half a degree overshoot, but it might make a difference how long we overshoot for. So I think it's the length of the overshoot more than the magnitude, unless the magnitude becomes very large. Does that answer your question? I've answered it by basically saying we don't know, I think. <laughs> which, which to me is rather worrying, in all honesty. Exactly. Yeah. G given we are so close, actually, also to this. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Any other questions? I don't see any more hands up. So yeah, probably... yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my, sorry. My, my hand was up. Yeah. Okay, I, I so the, the, uh, the, the handstand in my in my uh, uh, mobile phone don't don't really work well. Sorry, <laughs> Rafa, go ahead. About like it's all right. Yeah, so I was uh, I was curious. So I, I I had trouble connecting, and I I connected at the when you were showing the the slide about the design of the overshooting scenarios, mm -hmm. and uh, so I was curious. Um, you 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 mentioned right that you will be you will uh, investigate also in the model or uh, probably develop the representation of the uh, uh, land management or carbon dioxide removal technologies or techniques. And uh, I was curious in those scenarios. Uh, you mentioned that you will work with the integrated assessment modelers to to uh, design realistic scenarios. So 
Yeah, are you planning to um, so the, the scenario with overshoot where you, you then you have uh, negative uh, CO2 emissions? Are you planning to do that those also with uh, interactive representation, so with the, the actual representation of uh, of CDR, or or will be more prescribed like uh, if it were direct uh, remove from air, something like that? I think we're going to try and do we'll do both actually. I think in the what I refer to as the idealized scenarios then it will be sort of controlled negative emissions that would just pull CO2 out of the atmosphere um, and ir irrespective of where it's pulled out, if you, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. Um, but then when, when we try and investigate more, more real policy IAMs, we will, we will try and do those uh, where we sort of actively take the CO2 out through, you know, placing it in certain regions. Um, and linking it to the rate that it can be taken out by something like X or something like afforestation. So, that, so then we would have the natural, the natural carbon cycle running um, and we will perturb the natural carbon cycle through changing the land use distribution. Yeah. That's, and then, anyway. that's going to be difficult though. So, so that, that's more what I would refer to as land use mitigation experiments rather than, um, you know, con controlling to be at a certain temperature level. Yeah, and are you planning on including also ocean, the CDR or? Uh, with, I, I think within, within the project as well, we didn't write that we would do anything on ocean CDR, um, but I know with the, the ocean people at NOC have already been doing a little bit of work looking at um, how, how, you'd, how you'd represent alkal, uh, you know, alkalinity and the CO2 uptake through changing alkalinity. Um, so I think we could do experimentation there if there were, if there was interest, let's say from the other groups in the, in the European project, um, then we could try. It's not, it's not, uh, something we've written down that we will do, but if it looks like it's mm. something that is got some traction in the community, then we would try and do it. Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah, we probably have to talk. So we, we starting this project in September and it's about representation of CDRs in, uh, realistic scenarios and mm -hmm. uh, yeah that's the yeah. the rescue project yeah. rescue project yeah yeah uh, i think yeah, there's but... probably there are there are a lot of point uh, things in common that we yep. can uh, yeah so i think about, the so pick, pick in our project is represented by nico bauer yeah and i got a feeling is he in rescue yes he is and he's up yeah. in sm as well <laughs> yeah right so... no i meant sorry in up dsm is what i meant he's in up dsm and he's and in rescue, rescue as well so, yeah so hopefully there's some strong overlap in terms i'm sure there'll be just a strong overlap in terms yeah. of development of the iam scenarios but mm. then the implementation of the in the earth system model in terms of land use is something that we're quite interested in how you do that mm. yep so definitely right. there'll be there'll be a need to talk well etienne in your group, of course, is well. You're involved in Opti ESM as well, of course, aren't you? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. We are both. We, so we, we, we will we will be talking as long as <laughs> as long as UK groups stay in the project. We'll be talking. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, you might get, you might suddenly get a lot of money to do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, we will start. So the Opti ESM and rescue will go at the same time. So yeah, more or less. Right. So uh, we will definitely have a. Uh, overlap and we try to do things uh, a bit uh, at the same time yeah yeah and in in the so in the uk project i described terra firma we don't formally have any iam groups but we've we've already talked with yuri rogel in imperial and a guy called paul dodds at ucl and mm. with the ucl group we've already got some iam scenarios that overshoot 1.5 degrees that have been yeah. developed so we've got a starting point already we're going to begin um and i think at least yuri is in rescue as well isn't he no he's not no oh, okay. oh, so there's about. only there's only uh nico bauer so the direct assessment model and then there's a there's another project called provide that's where he is i think it's called provide. yes yeah 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 provide is um, uh, coordinated by climate analytics yeah yep. yeah that's uh, well. and that, that's well, developing overshoot and investing overshoots as well but mainly from an yeah. im perspective yeah yeah there's a lot going on in that space hmm. okay thank right, you thanks um so the uh, any other questions from the audience 
Now, I, I wanted to ask you about the performance of the model. So you mm -hmm. said that in the hybrid uh, uh, configuration, you have something like two years per day. Yeah, at which... the moment, the hybrid configuration is, is approaching. It's improving all the time. It's approaching about double the speed of running everything at the, at the full high resolution. So we're able to speed up by about a factor of two. Okay, so you, you hope to get to something like four years per day. <sighs> Uh, with the hybrid one in the, the the sixty kilometer, it's the atmosphere that's well. When we, no, sorry. When we get to when we run the ocean at quarter of a degree with the biogeochemistry at sort of a, a third of that resolution, then the ocean is as slow as the atmosphere. Okay. Um, so we we put, put most effort into the atmosphere, to be honest, um, because previously it was the atmosphere that was the slow bit when we were running the ocean at one degree. Um, so when we have the ocean as well, will we be able to get up to four, four years a day? Uh, I don't know is the honest answer. Well, um, but it, it, it doesn't matter. So my, my question is, is not really dependent mm -hmm. of, of whether you get to three or four years per day. So it, it, it's more about the strategy that you, you mm -hmm. follow. So running at three or four years per day, yep. uh, when you're running ensembles of projections, mm -hmm. it, it's it's not a problem. So in yep. a way, it yep. doesn't matter. You 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 run your, your each one of the members in uh, three or four months mm -hmm. maximum, and uh, you can run you know ten members in parallel if you yep. want. So that's not an issue. But what about the spin up? So spin -up, where yeah. do you expect uh, the the uh, the spin up uh, really to to be hacked and uh, to be able to run? This 500 years or a thousand years mm -hmm. that you, you might need with such a complex model. Yeah. So what we had a complex model in the CMIP6. So in CMIP6, what we ended up doing, particularly for the ocean. So we ran, we started off by running the ocean in ocean only configuration with forcing taken from the existing physical model, had Gem3 GC 3.1, where we ran, we ran that for about 200 years in pre-industrial mode. And then we took out the atmospheric forcing and we ran the, we, we, we recycled through that and ran the ocean. Um, and we ran the ocean in the end for 5,000 years. Um, and at some point we switched from the, from the physical model, pre-industrial. We then got to where we had the earth system model running pre-industrial and we took out some forcing from that and kept the ocean going. Uh, and in parallel to that, um, we, were, we, were, we were taking an ocean state from the ocean only spin up and feeding that into the coupled model. And then that, that sort of put, made the coupled model jump ahead, if you like. Um, and that was running without the chemistry at the time. It was running with prescribed pre-industrial oxidants. Uh, and all parallel to that, we were taking out forcing from that and running the land model offline for thousands of years to spin up the carbon in the, in the land. And then we coupled them all together and we ran in the end for about another 500 years and then we turned the chemistry on and we ran for about another 250 years to get everything stable. So for the standard model, we think we can do the same thing again, of course. Uh, when it comes to the hybrid model, um, it's a bigger challenge. Uh, we think at the moment what we'll do, we'll follow the same basic procedure, we think, but we might have to, particularly for the ocean, take a one degree ocean state that's pre-industrial and initialize the quarter of a degree ocean at some way into that one degree ocean and we're getting, we need to establish that the dynamics are sufficiently similar that the quarter of a degree model will do something sensible with that one degree spun up. And I think that is probably the way that we will hack or circumvent the fact that we can't run okay. 5,000 years at quarter of a degree with the biogeochemistry on. But there's a learning process. There's there. a learning process, yeah. And that's work package one of the okay. EU project. Um, but that's the more likely route, I think. I mean, in the ideal world, we'd run in the agile world would run coupled for a long time and we'd start early enough yeah. um and i think we will try and run coupled and keep something going that's what we did last time but i doubt we'll be able to spin up properly in the time scale we'll be end end up left with for cmip let's say a cmip 7. Yeah. we don't know because we're starting this activity pretty early so we might have we might have an 18 month window to be able to spin up um but as always we always expect to be late with getting models ready so I imagine we'll be doing what you refer to as the hacking thing. And that the, the order one is that we take this low resolution model, spin that up to some beginning spun up state and use that as an initial condition for the high resolution okay. model.
Okay, good. And another question again, with the, uh, related to the low resolution and high resolution uh, or the hybrid versions. Mm -hmm. So you said that the ice sheets for obvious reasons are one of your targets. And, yep. uh, and mm -hmm. uh, you, you also said in your presentation that uh, resolution really matters when you when it comes to the uh, these uh, ocean entrainments yep. under yep. under the, uh, the ice sheets. Mm -hmm. So do you have the uh, feeling that a quarter of a degree will be enough to really get those entrainments? Uh, okay, so it, it so first I should say that the the, the, the most important thing is how well you how well you simulate the what the wider southern ocean. Okay. Um, and in CMIP six, I don't know if it was the case for you, but it was the case for us that our Orca one configuration gave a relatively decent simulation of the larger southern ocean, and the quarter of a degree model did not. It gave a poor simulation of the southern ocean. Um, so we developed some parameterizations for how you represent the interactions under the ice shelf. So we have a parameterization of um, what we might call the resolved circulations uh, under the ice sheets. That doesn't work brilliantly, but it works tenably. And that's what we used in those simulations okay. in CMIP6. Um, so now we, we, we also had some indication that a quarter of a degree is definitely better. And it means that we can do some what you might call explicit simulations under the ice sheet. But a prerequisite for that is to get the larger Southern Ocean represented well. So we have an emphasis in another EU project called ESM 2025 on improving the representation of mesoscale eddies at a quarter of a degree to try and improve the larger Southern Ocean okay. and connect it to that. So a quarter of a degree is not enough to, to explicitly simulate. We know that because we've got a 12th of a degree ocean model. Um, it's not coupled, but we run it. And it's been run with the ice sheets offline, and that does a significantly better job. Um, so we're going to use the the twelfth of a degree model to help us in terms of parameterizing things at either one degree or a quarter of a degree. So at a quarter of a degree is definitely better than one degree, but only if you get the Southern Ocean better. Okay. So there's so much that is needed <laughs> to do it. But again, it's more we're in the investigation stage okay. more than the really knowing that we can deliver solid projections. Mm -hmm. Maybe at the end, we'll be in a position where we can give something solid. Okay. Um, so it's investigation more and, and understanding. Yeah, sounds interesting because uh, as you as you said, it's uh, ice sheet behavior is, is one of the, I would say the largest uncertainty source of uh, sea level. It, sea level it's the largest changes. uncertainty in, some, in terms of sea level change, yeah. yeah. Yep. Okay. so. Um, we are uh, already at, uh, at the hour. So uh, I wonder if anyone wants to uh, intervene or ask a question. Um, I'm checking the, uh, that don't, I don't see any hands, but I, I can't really rely on, on my, uh, my mobile phone. Okay. Uh, Sorry, good. I had one, one last question. So yeah, go ahead, Rafa. So I'm Rafa, this guy is Marcus. So I connected as Marcus. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> the they both appear uh, with the same name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the the I see in the ocean you, you do this uh, the the grad, right? You go from uh, from quarter degree to zero seventy five. Yeah. And... So that that is something. It's a it's a facility that. So we're going to work on that in the optimism project. I don't know if you guys are as well. It's it's a f facility. So it was a facility called Degrad. It was developed yeah. by, um, well, initially in Paris and then in uh, Toulouse. And that's been updated a little bit by um, Eric Mazeneuve at Surfax and uh, Roland Seferin and Sarah Berta to Toulouse. So they have a version that now works in couple, coupled mode. It works definitely in, in ocean only mode anyway. Um, mm. That is a quarter, it runs with quarter degree dynamics and then it degrades. It degrades the dynamics and advects the biogeochemical traces at, yeah. a, at, at a third of the resolution, three times the resolution. Yeah. So you, 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 haven't, uh, you haven't used it yet. So it's. Uh... We haven't used it. So it, for okay. us, they have used it and they have run it in offline mode. Uh, and we will work with them in the EU project. In fact, we're going to start okay. for the EU yeah, project. Yeah. We're starting already. So um, yeah. through, you know, um, ECNES provide these kind of um, OASIS supports, they're called. 
And mm. a lot of the coupling is done through Oasis. So Eric will work with someone in my team. And they they started already, actually. And we hope okay. to have something. We hope to have something that's working by the end of the summer. Working technically, I should say. Not not scientifically, but technically by the end of the summer. Mm. Yeah, okay. That runs with our with our biogeochemistry Medusa. Yeah. So I uh, don't remember how, how expensive is Medusa. How many tracers does it have? Is it? It's it's cheaper than Pisces, for example. It has about I think it has about twenty five tracers. Oh, twenty five to thirty. So it's about the same then. Yeah. Okay. I I understand from Andrew and people it's cheaper than Pisces, but maybe not. Maybe not that's radically what, cheaper. That's what what it tells you, but it's not true. Is it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they tell us, but it's not true. You said. Yeah. yeah. Well, Andrew says that it's cheaper, but it's not true. <laughs> Okay, well, I'll, right. I'll tell him he said that. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. So uh, I suggest that we stop it here. So thanks again, Colin, right, for, for your talk. And uh, uh, we had uh, 25 people connected. Uh, so that, yeah, yeah, at, at, at least they, they, there's someone interested in yeah. what you do. Uh -huh. <laughs> they, that's they, good. It's really a good a good sign. And if it's but, boring, it means you can do something else, and that's all. Right. Of, of course, yeah, <laughs> always, yeah. It's a beauty of, uh, uh -huh. of uh, this yeah. We love offline. It. we love offline talks now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much. And uh, uh, Colin will be uh, uh, here until this afternoon. Yeah. Uh, and yep. uh, he uh, you, uh, he'll be sitting uh, just up opposite uh, from my my office in the in the big uh, meeting room uh, here, so that uh, he can do all his teleconferences. As okay. Well. Cool. So um, if you want to have a chat with him, uh, just uh, show up and- uh, Yeah, best between, well, I don't know what time we're going for lunch, but I, I, after three o'clock, I'm a little bit stuck with headphones on. Okay, good. Okay, thanks very much. And uh, uh, see you or talk to you at the next webinar.